Matt's chatter, so just give us a minute before we begin. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like some of us are already loaded. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Nats Chat, sponsored by Inside View Press. And we're um, so grateful to have Matt Edwards here to share his knowledge with us about audio technology, which I've already confessed to him I know nothing about. So I'm really hoping that the, the chatters on tonight will have lots of wonderful questions for him to lead an exciting conversation. Um, thanks, Matt, for joining us. Welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's just start just with a brief introduction. Um, I know you. one of the most exciting things is you have a book that's just come out called So You Want to Be a Rock Singer. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's been an exciting process. It's a, it was a project for, of course, Nats, part of the So You Want to Sing series. And uh, I was approached by Alan around two years ago, I guess, at this point, and, uh, to write this book as part of the series. And, it was, it was exciting and challenging, but trying to bring something together that really covered the history and the vocal technique that also mentioned voice science and vocal health, and uh, as well as talking about styling and uh, audio technology and how to kind of look at yourself as an artist and as you know, a business person in this uh, field. And it was a challenge trying to bring all of that together, but I'm pretty excited about it. And I think it uh, offers a lot. There's going to be a second edition down the way. And, uh, I was reading through it the other night and noticed a couple things. So, you know, your work is never done. But, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. And it is available currently? Yeah, it's available through Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, uh, Books A Million. Apparently, uh, in New York, it's on some of the uh, store shelves. But I think Nats and uh, Roman Littlefield, the publisher, are mainly marketing it online. And is it digital or hard, hard copy? It's available in both versions. There's both a uh, digital, I mean, the, the hard copy, and there's a Kindle version as well as a Nook version. Well, that is, gosh, even I want to read it just based on what you've talked about. It covers a, a breadth of uh, information, it sounds like, beyond yeah. just audio technology or... Yeah, and we try to do, as I wrote it, I tried to bring together, especially in the technique things, ideas from other people than just my own, to make it not just a, a one person's technique, but an overview, pulling from people like Jeannie Lavetri and uh, some of Lisa Popeil's stuff, Melissa Cross's stuff, uh, even looking at some of the exercises that come out of the more commercial things like the Brett Manning's work and, uh, and you know, the speech level singing and the Estel stuff, just trying to bring it together so it exposes you to a whole lot of different ideas, but with exercises to help you explore your voice and start to find how to make these different sounds and uh, embody them. And then it you know, refers back to the chapter by Scott McCoy and Wendy LeBorn, and we're always talking about vocal health. Because the most important thing with all of this as you're trying these you know, sounds that could potentially be dangerous is to make sure you're taking care of the voice because we don't want to ruin that for life. So take us back a little bit before we open it up to questions from our chatters tonight about the topic. Um, I know you are classically trained, master's degree, and I, I believe you're currently working on your doctorate, are you not? Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, how does the road then direct you to now being one of the preeminent experts on audio technology? And also, um, along with that, at Shenandoah, you are the only program in the country that the music theater cohort studies for, a, is it an entire year in the yeah. pop rock genre? I mean, that, those are pretty cutting-edge ideas. So can you walk us through just a little bit about that for you? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's been a crazy path. I started off in high school in a rock band, and I was doing musical theater. I was singing in choir. Uh, my family's been in this country since the 1600s, and uh, they're all loggers and coal miners and farmers and iron workers. And then my dad and his uh, father were uh, both factory workers. And they got it in their mind that I was going to college one way or another. And uh, so I decided, hey, what better thing to go to college for than music? I can stay with my rock band and, you know, be better, you know, become a better singer, a better musician. And when I got to school as a voice performance major, I discovered that it really wasn't a rock singer degree, that it was more of a, uh, you know, opera degree. And of course, I mean, I auditioned with the Italian songs, and I knew I'd be doing some of that, but 
you know, I had been doing the choir thing, and I was a little confused. I didn't have great direction. And, um, but I got cast in the opera within the first month. They were doing Magic Flute, and they needed somebody to sing the role of the speaker and the second man in armor and the uh, second priest. And so I got to do that, and I, I really enjoyed it. I was a low voice. I was more of a bass at that time when I started school. And, uh, you know, the rock stuff was hard because I didn't have much above a middle C. And so we were transposing songs way low as I had no idea how to sing them. And uh, in opera, I got to kind of combine both things, the theater stuff that I liked and singing and parts that actually fit my voice. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Eventually, one of my vocal coaches told me I should probably transfer to a conservatory, so I transferred to the Cleveland Institute of Music. And uh, it was there that I met Beverly Rinaldi, and uh, she was my voice teacher for my three years there, and she worked miracles. And there was a certain point during my senior year, she said, I think you're going to be a voice teacher one day, and a good one, and I want to help you start down that path so we can make that happen. And she made me her work-study teaching assistant. And um, basically, I would go observe her lessons with the freshmen, and we had a couple high school young artists. And I would observe those lessons and then take them into a practice room and kind of repeat the lesson with them and teach them how to go to the library and look up resources and how to practice. And it was great. And after that, I went and I did uh, educational outreach tours with Lyric Opera Cleveland and Cincinnati Opera. And I went to Louisiana State University uh, to get my master's degree. And I had an assistantship where I was teaching students there. And the students I had were a lot of non-majors. And they weren't looking to sing classical stuff. They wanted to sing, you know, pop rock music or music theater. I had a couple that were doing, a, you know, leader, a church leader, church music. Um, and so I was looking at these guys going, well, I do have to get them to learn how to sing Carl Mio Ben or at least one equivalent song to pass their jury. But we have 15 weeks and I can surely teach them some other things. And so we started playing around with their music. And I started realizing that my voice was kind of, at that point, tied a little bit in a knot where I couldn't get out of the classical sounds. And I was unable to make the kind of sounds that I used to be able to make. And I started realizing that I really loved that music, and it was something I was really interested in. But I kind of been pushed away from it a little bit, just because it was often, it wasn't considered a beautiful use of your voice or something that you would really want to aspire to. And so I really started trying to dissect what it took to get my voice back to that place where it was more speech-based singing. And the first person I came across was Seth Riggs, and I heard about speech-level singing. And I couldn't find any books. But I thought, well, maybe the first step is to sit down at the piano and try to sing a song like I speak. And I started with Mary Had a Little Lamb. And this is in the exercises in the book that I came up with of trying to speak Mary Had a Little Lamb and put it on pitch after that. And I got to say, that was terribly difficult. My voice, I was so used to singing at that point with a lower laryngeal position, a lot of depth in my voice, a high soft palate, and I could not just sit there and sing, Mary had a little lamb, and I found that really frustrating. And so I started going through the Nats journals in the library and looking for articles, and I started coming across people like Robert Edwin and Jeannie Lavetri and Lisa Popeil, and I started grabbing onto every single thing I could. Uh, as YouTube became more popular, I started going through all the YouTube videos I could find, and I started getting my own voice back and helping others. And I ended up with a gig with a band that had been signed by a record label based out of L.A. And their producer, a guy named Greg Ladani, had uh, won like five Grammy Awards producing people like Jackson Brown, Fleetwood Mac. And uh, he came in and wanted a vocal coach for these guys in the band. And so I started hanging out with them at their rehearsal studio where they had their full sound system. And they had the original tracks from their album, and they were trying to figure out how to integrate some of the pre-tracked uh, things like the piano and some of the background vocals with the live music. That was just starting to kind of become a thing back then in 2005, where they were learning to sing along to their pre-recorded tracks with their in-ear monitors. And I was trying to teach the background singers how to sing and how to, the uh, percussionists to play piano. And it kind of started to blow my mind. I'm sitting here in this big rehearsal space integrating technology for every single thing we do. And I remember the first time I heard the, uh, the singer, the lead singer, singing in the room, and he sounded amazing. I said, well, why don't you get off the mic so they can hear you know, the power in your regular voice? And he got off the mic, and it was such a difference. The voice quality was still there, and he had this awesome tone, but it had no power compared to once you put him on a mic. And that was the instant that I started really realizing this kind of singing is dependent on audio technology. And I started hanging out in recording studios and watching different artists come into work and started learning some of the tricks. 
things about how they'll double track and triple track and quadruple track vocal lines uh, and how they'll use all these effects that we've talked about in the video and I've talked about in my book. And I uh, started learning how to use graphical auto-tune, where you can take a little squiggly line of a note and put a dot at one end and a dot at the other and draw a completely different note, and then go in and take all the vibrato out. And uh, it got me excited. I've always been into technology, and so I just kind of started digging around and piecing this all together. And in 2009, I uh, saw an ad for the Nats intern program, and I saw that Jeannie Levestri was going to be one of the master teachers. And I said, I am writing a letter to work with Jeannie and say that's what I want to do. And I wrote my letter and I was amazed that I got chosen and I was placed with Jeannie and uh, Dr. Scott McCoy and it was a life changing experience. Uh, that summer I went and did Jeannie's workshop here at Shenandoah. In the fall I was told there was a job opening at Shenandoah for a person who had a classical background, had performed musical theater and had a professional rock experience working with singers and understood the uh, you know, recording studio side of things. I read the ad and thought, uh, that's me. That was very bizarre. <laughs> everything, that I, yeah, everything that I had done that people always said, you're just scattered in all these different directions and I saw this ad and I thought, but that's why my whole purpose was to do all these crazy things like running a black box theater so that I could understand theater enough to go be a part of the theater program and try to really create something that hadn't been done. And so I came here, uh, it was the dean's decision to do this, the dean and the head of music theater, to come in and teach pop rock to the music theater majors and it had never been done before. And it has been a whirlwind, an exciting one. Uh, of the last five years, and I think we've really come up with something great. My colleagues and I on the classical side of things get along wonderfully. They all teach the music theater majors. The students study with one of them for three years, and they come to my studio, and it works great. Mm -hmm. And we all respect each other. We all talk with each other, and uh, couldn't really ask for a better situation. Well, and since I know your colleagues well, I, I yeah. know an enviable um, collaboration you all have there. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about audio technology a little bit. And, um, you know, is um, obviously music theater cr sounds now cross a lot of boundaries from legit to belt and even this rock sound. And then there's the added component of uh, audio technology. And having watched your video tonight, and um, hopefully those of you who are on tonight had a chance to watch it, we did post on the Facebook page, Nat's Chat, a 45-minute kind of tutorial that Matt has done. And I found the examples remarkable. The difference was remarkable. So just lead us into this conversation, and then hopefully our chatters will have lots of wonderful um, questions for you. Yeah. The, um, so the examples I put together, it really relates back to that first experience with that band. When I heard the guy on the recording first, then I hear him on the live mic, and then I have him step away from the mic, and it's like, this is very different. And um, if you, those of you who haven't seen it yet, I have examples of Broadway singers singing off a mic and then on a mic. I have examples of uh, rock singers doing the same. Some of them are in that 45-minute video. Others are on the YouTube channel. And then at the end, I have these isolated vocal tracks of rock singers where you hear only their voice and the effects that are layered on. Um, the microphones really started taking over Broadway with the production of Hair. Before Hair, they say that there were some performances where they had an individual performer body mic. But most of the microphones were air mics or floor mics that picked up the entire stage. And it was there really to kind of enhance the uh, vocal production and help it carry a little bit further in the theater, but it wasn't meant to totally take over. With Hair being, you know, a big rock musical, they got wireless mics on every performer on that stage, and once people realized that was a possibility, they started moving more and more in that direction. They say the first, uh, there's an important change that happened with Jesus Christ Superstar. And Jesus Christ Superstar was originally recorded as a concept album. And they had a lot of time to work in the studio. I think they say on Gethsemane, they took around 12 weeks to record it. And they wanted to get it perfect. And then once they had it perfect, they started shipping it out. And people picked up the album, and they were listening to it and falling in love with it. And then they decided, hey, let's turn this into a stage show. And so they started putting it on stage. And then they realized once it opened that they had a problem, that everybody was coming to the theater because they had fallen in love with the cast recording and the way it sounded and that they needed to figure out how to make the live performance sound as exciting as the cast recording did. 
And Gethsemane was a big problem because, you know, like I said, the guy had taken like 12 weeks to record it, and here he's got to sing it six, eight times a week with those crazy high falsetto notes and even the higher chesty mix stuff that he does. Well, they realized that this was a moneymaker. You have people all of a sudden, you know, buying all these cast albums up. It's getting them to the theater. So they stumbled across a model that worked well. And we see it really, really take off in the British Invasion shows. Those are the things like Phantom of the Opera, Cats, Miss Saigon, Les Mis. They start releasing these cast recordings, and they get people to the theater. And now we have to make sure that that experience in the uh, theater is the exact same. And not only is it the exact same in New York City, New York has to be just like London, which needs to be just like a production that's in Chicago, the one that's on the national tour, and the one that's on the international tour. So all of a sudden, we're trying to get people to no longer just be individualized performers, but hogs in a machine. That whenever it's time to find a new Javert, we need to be able to pop him in and make him sound convincingly similar to what the cast recording was. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think we really start seeing them play with the audio technology more and more. They start trying to replicate some of those studio effects that they used on the live stage. And that gets easier and easier into the 90s when uh, automation starts coming into the soundboards. You know, in the early 90s, you were still doing a lot of sliders. As the 90s move on and into the 2000s, you start getting computers that are able to, you know, take over the soundboard. You hit one button and everything shifts to where it needs to go. And that's how it is now in a lot of these Broadway shows. They have all these presets and they have somebody calling cues uh, in the stage management team for the sound guy to hit a button all the parts fade to where they're supposed to, and then he only has to control a few knobs. But they can make it so that in a ballad, there's a lot of reverb. I was talking to one of the guys that does uh, the sound for the Chicago tour. He said, you know, some of them, they have reverb really heavy on the ballads, and then they have almost no reverb once you get to one of the dance numbers. And it's all computerized, which takes a lot of the hassle out of it. So it's really now enabled them to do pretty much anything they want, and they're taking advantage of it. It gets to be a little bit... Uh, Interesting, though, because we can then have these conversations with how much does it matter if they can actually sing or not. Do we care if they can actually project their voice and sing fully, or are we just looking for somebody with a unique tone that they can put on a microphone and it'll do the rest? Mm -hmm. And that's a long conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, let's do this. Let me, um, let me give a brief tutorial so people can start asking some questions as you and I continue. So for the chatters that may be new this time, I should have done this at the beginning, but um, you see there's a little hand uh, in your go to webinar control panel. There's a little tiny hand that looks like this at the top. If you have a question, you can click on that and then I will introduce you and open your microphone and allow you to ask your question to Matt. If you prefer not to be on microphone, there is a question box, and if you just click on that, you can type your question to me, and I will read it on your behalf. So there are a couple different ways for you to ask questions of our guests tonight, and I, anytime, go ahead and, and just start typing or raise the hand, and um, we'll be able to start that part of the conversation. So, Matt, if, if someone, you and I were discussing before we started that we thought maybe 20% of Nat's teachers um, are using some of this technology, do you, how important is it if you are somebody who works either with music theater singers or rock singers? Obviously, I, I would assume you think they should have a microphone and some of the basic equipment in their voice studio, just like we have a piano. Is that right? And how would you guide somebody down that path? Yeah, I do. I think it is something that we should all be integrating. Uh, my colleague here, uh, Dr. David Meyer, he's got a great analogy for it. And what he says is if we're trying to put people out there into the world to be electric singers, essentially, they're always singing on a microphone. We need, it would be the equivalent, not training them to use a mic would be the equivalent of taking somebody who wants to play electric guitar and only ever teaching them on an acoustic and then saying, go out there and have fun, do your gig, and then hand them an electric guitar. There's different ways that you can strum it and get different sounds. There's harmonics that you can play on an electric that you can never get away with on an acoustic. And a lot of the same things are, uh, there's equivalence on the voice. The falsetto things that you hear those guys doing in the high rock falsettos, they're not the same as what you would do if you're trying to sing countertenor. And there's resonance strategies that we use in a acoustic singing in order to make sure our voice is heard that we don't need when we're doing an amplified singing style. And so what I see is that people 
they hear the cast recording and they're trying to replicate that sound with their pure acoustic voice and they start constricting and squeezing and they end up doing harm to their voices. Whereas a lot of times if I throw them on a mic and turn it up a little bit and add reverb, they realize that they can back off and get the exact same sound that they were trying to get without screaming their heads off. And since most of our young music theater performers are going out into the world and probably going to do something like a non-equity tour where they're performing six to eight times a week, they're traveling around on a tour bus, and oftentimes with no one understudying their role, or if they do have someone, they're still being pressured to go on, go on. I think there's tricks that we can teach them about microphone placement and things they can ask from the sound guy to help save their voice in those less than ideal situations. So for instance, let's say you're feeling really vocally exhausted, you know there's no clarity in your voice and you're missing a lot of that clean, buzzy sound you want, you can move the mic from being like back here all the way up to the edge of your mouth. That's already going to make your voice seem louder and brighter. And then you can ask the sound guy just to give you a little bit of boost in the treble. And once he does that, he's basically creating artificial forward placement for you. So now instead of going up there and having to use your full breath support and trying to really, you know, put that twang in the sound, you can kind of sit back a little bit and let the mic do the work. And so for those young musical theater people, I think it's really, really important. For our rock singers, a lot of times they go into the studio and they get really excited and the audio guy gets excited and they're, you know, double stacking, quadruple stacking or more. There's a, a, the guy from Fun who recorded this song, uh, Some Nights at the beginning of it, they say I think there's 96 vocal stacks on this record, which is insane. They say on the Boys to Men uh, recording, one of the last ones they did, they made six stacks of six different vocal parts for a quintet. And so they get carried away, they do this in the studio, then they got to go out live and perform this. Well, on those big name bands like Boys to Men, they can track in some of those other vocals in the background. But if you have a kid that went to a studio and did all those tricks and then he's still kind of playing in your local bars, I think we're kind of setting him up for failure. He's going to go and, you know, hand out all these CDs and then go into the bar and just use their stock system and it's not going to have the same qualities. Whereas we can teach them to use some of these digital vocal effects processors like those that are made by TC Helicon and they enable the user to set predefined effects like vocal doubling and tripling and harmonies and digital delays and the transducers that make it sing, sound like you're singing through a megaphone. And they can program all their songs into that board so that they match the recording that they made exactly. And so that's good for their, you know, business side of things. They're selling a live product that's just as good as the studio product. And I also think it's good for their voice because now they're not out there on stage trying to recreate that gritty sound that they got through some special effects. They're just dialing in the special effects. And the other advantage is all of those units allow the singer to bring along their own vocal monitor. So they plop their own little uh, PA facing up at their face, they plug it in from the splitter on the back of the helicon, and they can take control of how much of their voice they hear. And we know from some studies that have looked at uh, teachers in the classroom that there is a reduction in vocal load when the teachers use some sort of audio amplification that they can hear. And there's also been some research that looks at audio monitors for rock singers that has found that if you boost the treble on those monitors, it does improve your hearing in the, uh, as a singer and your audio feedback. So I think there's a lot to it that we could be exploring and really helping people and maybe preventing them from ending up, you know, in the uh, ENT's office. So some of that that you were just talking about, it seems to me, is really in the recording studio. Equipment, things that happen in the studio more than in the private voice studio. Am I... Am I right in that? And, and so what I would love to know is in your private studio, what equipment do you use? Sorry, yeah, so, yeah, a lot of this stuff happens in the recording studio, but then it, that's what I'm saying is it happens there and then it affects everything else as people are moving forward. And so I think it's why it's useful for a, a singing teacher who works with that population to hang out in the recording studio and get to see what they're doing and learn some of the tricks. So that way when the student comes to you and they bring you the recording and say, hey, this is what I recorded and we're getting ready to go on tour, you can listen to it and go, okay, so you, know, you obviously use delays and I can hear you've layered your vocals. How are you planning on dealing with that live? Mm -hmm. Because if they haven't come up for a strategy to do that, 
we need to then come up with one to help them and make sure that they're not just screaming their face off trying to get those same sounds. Um, in my own studio, I have an uh, SM58, it's the basic mic, looks like this guy. So I'll, I have one of these in my uh, studio at the school as well as my home studio. Uh, I've got a Bose Tower PA system that I use in my office. I also have, I grab this here, ah, this focal effects processor, it's the uh, TC Helicon. It's this guy here, it's the Voice Live Play 3 or 2. This one runs around $600. It's the upper end. It's what a lot of the pros use. But there's a consumer-grade version of it that I have at home, which is the uh, Voice Live Play, and it's around $200. But both of these can be pre-programmed with all of those recording studio effects. So basically, you plug in your microphone on the back of this guy and plug it in over here, and then you have two outs. And so one of those outs goes to the soundboard for the sound guy. The other one can go to your own personal monitor. If you are playing an instrument, you can plug in your instrument on this side. And what the machine will do is it will follow the pitch of whatever you're playing or the chords that you're playing. And if you want to sing harmonies, you hit the harmony button, and it will build the harmonies based off of the chords you're playing on either your keyboard or your guitar. If you want to kick in the auto-tune function, it will actually follow whatever chords you're playing and auto-tune you to one of the notes in that chord. Wow. Uh, it also has options over here that you can do MIDI controls. I've never used that, but if you have a MIDI interface you want to control this with, you can. Then basically you set up each one of these little pedals, as you can see have different markings on them to do what you want. So we can have the double button set up, and if I want to double my vocals on only the chorus, I just click the double button and my vocals are doubled. As soon as I'm done singing the chorus, I can click it off. If I want to kick on harmonies, I just click the harmonies or take it off. I have reverb up here as well. You can see there's delay. U-Mod gives you things like uh, alien voices and megaphones. It's really good for people who are into death metal. Uh, there's a random effects button here you can play with. And this has these presets and buttons as well as step buttons. And what that allows you to do is basically set up the verse, the pre-chorus, the chorus, and the bridge in this machine so you just keep hitting the up button or the down button to transfer in between each one of those sections of your song. So you can literally replicate every single thing that the sound guy did in the recording studio into this pedal. So when you perform live, you're getting all those effects. And so as the singing teacher who works with that population, I'm helping them you know, get their machine set up. If they haven't bought one, I'm getting them to buy one. And then I'm getting them accustomed to how to you know, compensate with this thing. So like if you are singing death metal and we're going to triple you with this and we're going to add in a megaphone effect, you don't have to be screaming your face off like you may have done for that you know, 30 seconds in the studio, but instead we can get the mic so it's touching your lips and teach you how to make those growly fry sounds and let the machine do the rest of the work. And what I find is if I don't teach them those techniques to back off, they often don't learn them on their own. They just go out there and keep trying night after night to reproduce acoustically what was created electronically. Right. Thank you for that. So our, our fabulous Ed Remains Weekly has asked a question, but she's agreed to let me open up her mic. So I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. All right. No, I basically was just um, videoing uh, uh, Matt on this. Um, highly recommend that uh, studio teachers who work with uh, commercial singers and musical theater singers as well to purchase this TC Helicon Voice Live. I don't have the fancy one like um, you have, Matt, but I have the what? What is the one that I have? The the Voice Live Play. Yeah, the Voice Live Play. So it's not as fancy as Matt's, but it has a lot of the same things, and I've been able to uh, with my students. Um, have them sing a little bit more softer, as he was speaking earlier, and also to get, I use Gorgeous Hall a lot, especially with my younger um, students, because it has a nice, nice quality to it. But it also gives them an opportunity to back off, like Matt was saying, and uh, sing in a jazz style, which I introduced them to during their freshman year to get them a little bit more off of some of the pop rock because they come to me with a lot of pop rock and so we have to kind of strip it down a little bit, get to where we can get a little bit more of that musical theater quality because eventually they will go into uh, pop rock later on and then eventually off to Matt. So I find it extremely useful to maintain vocal health 
um, as Matt was saying earlier, uh, and letting them back off of their voices so that they realize, and they can hear themselves a lot better because they've got nice speakers that we have with them as well, and um, you know, realize that, oh gosh, I'm overblowing it. I don't need to sing that heavily. Um, and be able to do, you know, nice small fries instead of some really unhealthy sounds. So that enables them to hear themselves a little bit more um, than they would normally just singing without a mic. Um, I don't know what else I wanted to say about that, but I highly encourage every studio teacher that works with commercial singers to do that. And I have one in my studio at SU as well as one of, in my home studio. Yeah. Thanks, Edra. Yeah, I agree. And uh, what she mentioned, too, brought up two things. First of all, this fancy, expensive unit I have, I have it because when I get professional people coming in, I like to be able to show it to them and convince them to spend the money on it. A lot of times, you know, your singer doesn't buy any equipment, yet your electric guitar player is buying a $3,000 guitar and a $3,000 amp. So I try to convince the singers that, hey, you can go swing 600 bucks to buy something to take care of your side of the things. Um, for 99% of the teachers out there, the Voice Live Play that's the $200 unit is more than enough. And what's really nice about it that Edry mentioned is that it has presets. And the preset she's talking about is number seven in the unit. It's called Gorgeous Hall. And it's basically set up to sound like a recital hall. So you don't have to know anything about what the settings are or how to put them in there. You just press the up button until you get to Gorgeous Hall. And you sing through it, and you get this gorgeous uh, reverb in there and a little bit of uh, equalization that's done along with the room. And if you want to then put a delay, you just switch up to like number eight, which is a, a pong delay. It sounds like a ping pong ball bouncing around the room. And uh, it makes it really easy to use this equipment. And uh, I, if it would help, I can probably throw some of the links up for this stuff on the Nats Chat uh, Facebook page after the talk. That would be great. Um, Matt, you mentioned... Um uh, auto tune, and I remember when Glee first started, and it was kind of this big, you know, deal about oh, you know, they're auto tuning, and I can hear it. And um, is that just and, and in the line of business you're in, that's just accepted now, right? And what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, there's a whole lot of articles and things I've come across with. So there's one of uh, Justin Bieber doing a news interview which is like a W-E-N-N, -N. and uh, I'm pretty sure it's cited in my book, and he says that 99% of artists are using auto-tune. So I, I don't know if it really is 99% or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, in my research, I found an article talking about making the Grey Gardens cast recording, and uh, they said that they used graphical auto-tune around a dozen times on that. Uh, I found an uh, article about uh, doing Paul McCartney's album and how they went in and removed vibrato from all the sustained pitches using Melodyne, which is one of the autotune programs. The Metropolitan Opera has its own version of autotune. The uh, engineer for the live broadcasts records all the dress rehearsals leading up to the broadcast, and then they broadcast the thing live. But then before they put it to a final recording on DVD or CD, if there was a bad note or something that wasn't as good in performance as it was in the dress rehearsal, he'll isolate that pitch and copy and paste the dress rehearsal note into the live performance note before they put it onto its final release. Hmm. So obviously this is happening everywhere. There's been a lot of country singers that have been signing what they call the No Auto-Tune Pledge. Uh, there's people like Joss Stone who take great pride in not having to rely on it at all. She likes to walk into a recording studio and record a song three to four times all the way through, and she wants to be done. If there is something, like if she liked the verse from take one and the chorus from take four, she'll piece those together, but she doesn't want to be going in there and trying to fix just one high note. Um, I think it really varies artist to artist. I think if we look at that demographic that targets the preteens and the teens through college and a little bit past college, you're more likely to find auto-tune being used because it's a highly processed sound in a lot of ways, and uh, they like that kind of digital feel. Whereas when you get into the singer-songwriters like Sarah Bareilles and the Rufus Wainwrights and the people that appeal more to that you know, 30-plus crowd, I think you hear a lot less manipulation going on, and they're less likely to turn to auto-tune. Interesting. We have a comment from Jeff Costello who says it's very close to 99% using auto-tune, yeah. uh, is his awareness as well. Um, and um, 
Oh gosh, I actually, Edry mentioned something about uh, CCM using Studio Live at uh, Shenandoah University. Well, yeah, we use it in the uh, the CCM Master's degree. So all of our uh, all of our students in the uh, Contemporary Commercial Music Voice Pedagogy program, they all do a recital as uh, their culminating project. And so we have those CC Helicon units in each of the studios of the teachers who teach those students. And they're learning how to use that, and they're able to pre-program their recital into the unit and uh, then take it into the recital hall. So one of Edry's students is getting ready to do a recital, and in his pre-recital uh, pre hearing, he brought in his helicon. He had all of his effects lined up. And it's great because he had his hearing in a classroom, and he's going to have his performance in the chapel. And he knows that he can just take that box and pop it in the chapel and get the exact same sound qualities from you know his mic as he was getting in this little room with a little portable amp. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the advantages of that is it allows you as the singer to take control of your vocal tone. Because if you don't have something like your own microphone or your own effects processor, you're walking into each venue and just relying on the sound guy. And you know, hoping that he's got something to kind of sweeten up the vocals a little bit or hoping he's not chatting away in the back and not really paying attention to you. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think it really allows you to take ownership which is important. Mm -hmm. We have a question from our beloved David Sabella Mills. Go ahead, David. Oh, are you on? Hi there. How are you? I, uh, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I am sitting in my car and viewing you on my phone. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's amazing technology, speaking about technology, audio technology. Um, so I have actually two uh, questions for you. One, uh, what I find most often coming into my studio now are young students and clients who already have this sort of processed sound in their ear, and they are coming in live trying to make that sound. And so that results in a lot of fry, a lot of sitting on the voice, trying to get that sort of metallic equality and you know there's a whole process to sort of relax the voice and you know come out of that fry and speak up into their resonance etc um, so I'm wondering you know if you have this experience with your singers and if this technology that you're using is actually then helping them to to raise their resonance and get up off the fry of their voice or is that something that that the technology can or cannot help with and the second thing, uh, if you haven't already talked about it, is I'd love to discuss a little bit of the in-ear monitors that are now in such use. And I, I find them very difficult to use myself. Some of my clients have, have let me put them on, and I don't know how anybody sings with these. It's a whole new world when you have those you know, custom-made in-ear monitors. So can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. The, um... So on your first question, yeah, I have had it come in too. There's a there's a style of music emo. Uh, if you guys don't know, it means emotional. And uh, I had an emo singer that came to me doing exactly what you said. He's really trying to make those sounds off the recording, and that's where I do think it's this technology becomes useful is to sit there and say, look, man, you're these guys aren't doing that with their raw voice. We're going to use this equipment to get that. And so usually the process I use is to get them vocalizing first and trying to get them out of, you know, their throaty singing off of just, you know, pure fry and helping them free up the mechanism. As they free up the mechanism, a lot of times they're not liking the sounds and I just tell them, trust me, we're going to put you on the mic at the end and you're going to get an example of what that's like and if I need to, I'll demo it for them. I'll make a sound off mic and then put the microphone in front of my mouth and take it away so they can hear that, wow, this really does make a difference. And I'll keep kind of coaching them into the place where I want to get them, the place where it's free and they're not, you know, singing with as much uh, constriction, and then I'll hand them the mic and have them, you know, hear themselves through the monitor. And once they do, they're pretty much always amazed. They're surprised at what it sounds like coming to them through the speaker versus what they're hearing inside as I'm vocalizing them. And you can always see that, like, aha moment where they realize I'm not completely crazy, just slightly, and uh, that this thing really does make a difference. And um, I then kind of structure lessons that way, is I really try to keep them off the mic until I think that they're freeing something up, then I put them on the mic. Or if they really do push, I'll crank up the PA, put the mic right in front of their mouth, 
and have them sing and see if they naturally back off a little bit, which a lot of times they will. And so I kind of use the two hand in hand to get them, you know, into a much better place vocally. And then it's a mix with a lot of them. We end up working off mic quite a bit and just helping them really identify what all that's like and then putting them back on the microphone to make sure they like the sounds and then showing them, you know, little tricks of, hey, you can really back off in this section and you notice with the compression and everything the way it's set up, nobody's going to notice the difference. And then when you hit these high notes, you also don't have to hit it as hard because it's the way it's compressed, you're going to still sound as loud as you do when you push. And so those kind of conversations and teaching them about the equipment I find helpful. On the in-ear monitors, it is something that's getting to be brought up more and more. There is a research study, I believe it was Daniel Zengerborch out of uh, Sweden that did it, but it was looking at in-ear monitors versus floor monitors. And what they found is that they were trying to figure out uh, on the volume level, the listening level of these monitors, did in-ear monitors reduce the volume level that musicians wanted to hear themselves at? And they called this the preferred listening level. And so they went through and they had them sing and basically set the levels that they wanted it at. And what they found was that the volume levels for in-ears and floor wedges were the exact same for their preferred listening level. So essentially it, made, it had no benefit in terms of uh, preventing hearing damage. They said, though, that if you could train the people to uh, turn down the ear monitors a little bit and get to this place that it was an acceptable limit, an acceptable volume level, they could maybe tune down the volume level of the in-ears by three to five decibels. But that's still not huge. So I think the first thing I'm throwing out there is if a musician is thinking about buying this, these in-ears because they think it's going to really help them uh, prevent hearing damage, I don't know that the science supports that. I think there's probably more research that needs to be done on it. But, you know, it's very likely that they're going to put these things in and turn them up just as loud or louder and actually be causing more damage than when they have a monitor in front of them that they walk away from and come back to. We are, of course, if they're in a lesson without a mic at all, they're learning to sing off of a combination of their sensorial new hearing and their conductive hearing, and they're getting used to hearing their voice that way. And if we then pop in ears right in there, you're probably going to really override a lot of that conductive hearing that they've been relying on. And so I think that can be a massive problem for them if they jump on a stage and they've never had that experience. Um, those in-ear monitors are custom made for each singer, so it's kind of hard to keep a set around your studio. But what I do is I put my students on earphones and I plug them into one of my recording interfaces and I have them sing uh, you know, through the recording interface with the over-the-ear uh, headphones. And that alone is often uh, can really mess with them. And this goes back again with the benefits of using this technology in a uh, studio. If your kid has never been to a uh, recording studio before, the first time they go in there and slap those big headphones on and try to sing through the mic, it can really throw them off. And then they end up wasting maybe a half day or a whole day trying to sing on pitch when they've never had pitch problems in the past. And this is what I've heard people talk about with these in-ear monitors. They have a hard time with pitch because they can't really tell what's what. And so giving them that experience in a supervised setting where you can help coach them what to listen for or what to do, I think can really be a benefit to them. You could be potentially in you know, 30 minutes doing that in a lesson, saving this person recording studio time. And uh, that's my best approach so far at helping them with the in-ear monitor thing. Uh, if anybody else has ideas, I'd love to hear them. I know Jeff has got experience with these as well. But uh, I think it's something that we're going to continue to be exploring because I've heard there's some talk about bringing them into musicals a little bit more and more. Not yeah. positive about that, but I've heard it brought up. Uh, there is, uh, I'll read three comments from Dee Bruce Moore who has some uh, observations, but I want to thank David um, before I do that for asking that question. Thank you, David, for joining us. So um, Bruce Moore says, I bring my own unit and just run a feed to the sound guy and my own in-ear monitor that doesn't rely on the sound guy. Way fewer issues, to issues taking control instead of handing it to a stranger. Um, yep. he, he also says, I have a student uh, prepping a studio recording and I will be getting him used to singing with headphones. It's a skill they need to make uh, a great recording, which you just uh, said. Um, and the benefit, the final thing he says is, the benefit of in-ears for the sound guy is lower stage monitor levels 
and easier to get a clean house sound what the public hears. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with that. And um, so yeah, and I what he's saying about bringing your own along, I think it's great. That's why I like again with the TC Helicon unit. And any time that you can take ownership, you're going to be in a much better spot than having to rely on someone else. And uh, yeah. So uh, uh, Matt, so take this actually into the classical realm for just a moment. So if I have a student sending off a recording um, to a program, a, C a high school, or even a college person getting ready for graduate school, um, and they, or a, a CD, whatever, they go into a recording studio and they certainly are not familiar with any of that experience. And they want to put us in a separate room from the piano and have a headphone. You know, when I've uh, been asked to do that, I've always said no. I know that it makes the recording more difficult and not as clean or whatever, but for the benefit of the experience, I've chosen not to do that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there's a there's a whole lot to consider when you're trying to make a classical recording. Um, if you're going into a, just a standard recording studio, they're designed to not have any room noise or to not really have any reverberation. And so the one studio I worked in in upstate New York basically had no right angles. And it was designed that there was lots of weird, like, angular spots, but it kept the uh, voice or instruments from bouncing around the room so there was no excess uh, noise. If you go into a setting like that, the classical voice isn't really going to sound its best. We all know that if you're in a dry practice room, it's not the same experience as if you didn't go into a recital hall. And so in that recording studio, the only way they have to kind of make up for that is to use digital reverb. And you can tell the difference between digital reverb and regular reverb. I think you're much better off finding a live performance space with uh -huh. a decent microphone. Even, um, even a guy like this, this Tascam mic right here. Okay. And this is the, uh, which one is this one? This is the DR05. It has a stereo pair up here, and this is what they often use when they're recording uh, recitals. Um, of course, they're more expensive mics, but this is about a $100 unit. These are two condenser microphones, so they're a little more sensitive. But a mic like this will pick up a little bit of that room sound, the sound of the voice reverberating in the room, as well as the, voice, the signal that comes straight from your voice. And what you want to do when you're trying to make this recording is find what's called the critical distance. And the critical distance is that spot in the room where the microphone is picking up basically equal amounts of the dry signal from the singer as well as the reverberated singer or the reverberated signal from the room. So let me see here. Have I sketched something out quickly here? So let's say we have a stage. We'll put a person standing right here. It's my beautiful stick figure drawing. And we know that as he sings, there's going to be a straight line of sound coming from him. But at the same time, a little bit of his voice is going to bounce off of the floor and ricochet back towards the back of the room. If we can find that spot in the room where the two intersect, that's probably about the ideal spot to place a microphone for a classical singer. Now, if you feel like it's a little bit too boomy or too reverby, then you want to move the microphone a little bit closer. And that means it's going to pick up more of the dry signal and less of the reverberated signal. If you want it to sound like you're in a cave, then put it all the way back in the back where basically the reverb signal overtakes the dry. The easiest way, I think, to find this is to use your iPhone. What I have uh, my students do is to turn on their iPhone and have a friend stand right in front of their mouth and do a video recording, have them sustain a pitch, and have their friend just start walking back and maybe call out Q1, Q2, Q3, or 10 foot, 20 foot, and just keep walking back as their friend sustains that note and then do it on the repeat, going from the far back point of the room back up all the way to their mouth. Then you hit stop and review that recording, and you will notice the point as they're backing up, and you see the, you know, the second pew in front of you that right there, you sound awesome. And as soon as you go further back, it's too roomy sounding, and if you're too front, it's too harsh. So I think that little process can really help you use a live room and get the effects that you want much better than paying $100 to go into a recording studio that's really not meant for acoustic music. For, okay. Oh, that is fascinating. And is some of that covered in your book at all or not? The critical distance stuff isn't, I don't believe. Yeah, I don't think it is. I try to think if it's in one of my other ones or not. I don't know that it is. Okay. Something I probably should add on the second edition. Thank you. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, as a follow-up to that, what about students, for instance, that I've sent to Shenandoah um, when we need to do a video? I believe you guys require video for the music yes. teacher program. Um, do, are there any tips for making certain that the sound is you know, laid into the video and it's not just the, the audio recording that comes right off the video recorder? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, for most of this, the whole video pre-screen thing freaks people out. I think the most important thing to understand is we're trying to save you money. You know, all of the programs are looking for uh, different things, and there are thousands of kids auditioning for 76 schools. You know, and so there's been years, if we go out and do all of our regional auditions, we're seeing 1,000 kids, and we're looking to take 18 to 24. And in the past, you're bringing kids to campus without ever seeing them, and they'd fly. We've had kids fly from California and Washington. They get here, and you know, within 10 minutes, they're just not at the same level as everyone else. So I'd encourage you to help the parents of these kids understand that we're not doing this to try to get something against their kids for not having a perfect video. We're trying to help sort out the ones that are right versus not. You spending $1,000 to produce a video isn't going to do anything extra for us. You can make a video with an iPhone 6 that will be just fabulous and for all that you need. If you can grab two iPhone 6s or an iPhone 6 and this CastCam DS, what, DR05, this will more than enough handle what you need. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to put the camera right where you need it to get the perfect video that you want. You're then going to find the critical distance and you're going to place your little task cam or your second iPhone wherever that critical distance is. You're going to hit record on both of those and then you're going to clap your hands two to three times really sharp. You would go or do it three times. What you're going to then see when you import your video and your audio is you're going to see a waveform that does this. I'm drawing it out here. So you'll see like the silent wave and then you'll see a big boost, a little silence and a big boost. Those boosts are your claps. And then all you need to do in a program like uh, the iMovie, or I believe even in the Windows uh, version, you can align the audio track to match up with the audio from the video. Once you get those two claps perfectly lined up, you can then mute the video audio. And once you do that, you now get the recording unit's audio perfectly synced with the video track. That's the easiest way to do this for any of these video recordings, and it's going to give you a great result, and it'll save you a ton of money. The iPhone 6 actually really does capture some uh, good sound, and DSLR cameras do as well. There was uh, one time when I first got here, we were experimenting with hauling down all of my recording equipment and trying to capture uh, some of these video submissions for my students versus just using the little handheld guy and using just the camera. And we found out that if we had the camera at the right distance, there was really no difference in audio. Oh, that is amazing. You don't even need a, a real video camera. You can just use your iPhone 6 now. Yeah, the iPhone 6 video is amazing. Now, I have a DSLR. I have a T3i that I use. And uh, what I would really recommend, if you want to get a DSLR to capture audio recordings, you want to grab what's called a prime lens. And a prime lens has no zoom function. It's just one uh, setting. So I have a 50 millimeter and I have a 24 millimeter prime lens. And they give you what's called the bokeh effect. And the bokeh effect is where it kind of blurs out the things off to the side of the face so you can really get clear up here and you don't have a bunch of stuff in the background. And uh, those DSLRs give you incredible video. But there is, again, the time I was recording a student and I was trying to make a YouTube video of how to record a student, and as I was in the room, the DSLR, for some reason, wasn't doing very well that day, and the iPhone 6 was doing gorgeous. And so we ended up keeping all the iPhone 6 video and using that. And then if you have any you know, concerns with the audio, you can do slight tweaking of like slightly boosting the treble or normalizing it, which kind of is compression that kind of evens out the volume levels a little bit, or you can add a little reverb if you want. Now, in general, I would not do that. I don't think it's a good idea to start messing with it a whole lot. I do, however, think it's okay to adjust it to match what you know the person really does sound like. So, like, we have a hall here at Shenandoah. It's a black box, and it makes everybody sound dead. It just makes it, everything sound woofy unless you have the mic, like, almost in front of their mouth, and then it's just too bright. So we almost always go in that room and slightly EQ the voice up in the treble frequencies to make it sound like the person actually sounds. Mm -hmm. And um, little things like that are okay. And then, of course, if they're going in for a pop rock audition and they're recording a pop rock song, 
you know, I think a little bit of compression or a little bit of reverb within reason can be okay. You know, because they're sitting there listening to, uh, you know, videos all day on their laptop, then you get a video submission for a rock musical, and if it sounds dead dry like it was in, you know, a practice room five foot from your face, it may not sound the best, and it may not be an accurate representation of what you are. I do think you have to be very, very, very careful that once you start playing around with anything beyond making it sound accurate. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, and just... Um for recording, uh, Bruce Moore says again, for recording the classical singer, the sound engineer can always boost the singer's formant. Um, yeah, a bit of a cheat, he says. Um, yeah. And it looks like David has one more follow-up. I'm going to open his mic up from the car. Go ahead, David. <laughs> Are you with Hi us? Hi there. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So, Matt, I have a question for you about all the technology that you do use in your studio. The amps... The uh, the recording device you said there. I see you have a guitar hanging in back. Yeah. I'm just wondering, one, how loud is it in your studio? I mean, is it viable for most of us independent studio teachers to be creating that much sound around our neighbors? And then you know, I have two worlds. I'm an independent teacher and I'm an adjunct. And so as an adjunct, I'm constantly moving room to room in my university, and I don't have yeah. that access. I mean. So if there was, I mean, how do I get around that? How loud is this technology going to make my room? And what do I need to have to just carry around if I'm, you know, very mobile on the go in my university? Yeah. I mean, it depends. I, you know, you can turn it up every once in a while, which I will. Like, a lot of times when I really turn it up, let's say I have a girl that comes in and she's a screamer. She wants to sing, you know, the big belly stuff and the defying gravities that get out and stay out in Brooklyn pieces, and she's just yelling her face off. At that point, sometimes I will turn up the system and get them singing at 50% so they can hear how overwhelmingly loud half their effort can be. Because my experience is they're often trying to recreate that bigger-than-life sound, and if I can show them, here's how you get it, sing 50% or 60%, let me crank up the sound volume, Allowed so they get the idea that, wow, this really does have a difference, I find that helpful. When I do that, what I then do is hit the mute button. On the system, there's a mute button, and so I'll have them be singing their song, and then I'll just reach over as I'm playing piano, hit mute, and then they'll hear themselves with nothing, and they'll realize it's a lot quieter. And then I'll hit the mute off so that the amp comes back up and they hear how big and glorious their voice is. Most of the time, though, I don't have it that loud. Most of the time, I'll bring it down, and we'll be usually playing with like the breath of your singer-songwriter styles, where the you know the crooners were the first people who really made the microphone part of their instrument, and they started realizing that hey, if I get up close to the mic, I can talk all breathy and make it sound intimate, and so uh, that was the purpose. They wanted it to be part of them. So when I have people bringing in that music, we're using the mic, but we're using the amplifier at a lower volume setting where it doesn't really bother my neighbors. Every once in a while, Edry will come knock on my door and say, hey, it's awfully loud. And so, you know, <laughs> we both know that sometimes we crank it up a little bit. And uh, she lets me know. But most of the time, I'm not pushing it up that high. And I'm usually not using it for an entire lesson. Uh, if they're getting near a gig and I am going to use it for an entire lesson, then, yeah, that could be a problem if other people are in the studio next door. Um, as far as the portability factor, there's two solutions. The one is a powered monitor. And um, I can throw this up on the Nats chat uh, Facebook page. And they sell for around $200. They're about the size of a carry-on suitcase. They weigh maybe around 30 pounds or so. And you can easily move that room to room. There's also a couple smaller ones that are the size of like a, a, a bookshelf-like style speaker, the Bose bookshelf speakers, that have a um, powered unit in it. And those can work. It's not as good of a sound as a bigger system, but it can work. Um, when I do presentations, like at uh, the Southeaster Theater Conference, I carry around a Bose sound link. And the Bose sound link is maybe like nine inches long by like a half, five inches high or so. Uh, it's a Bluetooth speaker. It's uh, rechargeable, and it has a little headphone uh, or, a, you know, what, eighth inch in jack, line in jack. And on the TC Helicon, it has a headphones out jack. And so what I'll do is I'll take my Helicon, plug it in, and then take my little, you know, eighth-inch jack thing and plug it into the both of them, and it gets the job done. 
and helps people even, at, you know, the last SETC thing I did, I had 100 people in the room, but they could all still hear the difference between the person not singing on the mic and the person singing on the mic. And so if I'm just trying to get them accustomed to that, that works. And again, what's nice with that, uh, the Helicon, if you're looking for portability, because it has that headphone jack, if you want to do some of the work in preparing them for a recording studio, you can just slap on the big headphones through that unit and you don't really need a whole lot. And so that's usually when I'm traveling and doing presentations, that's the basic rig that I always carry around. And uh, if I want a little more umph, I have a pair of the uh, Bose uh, computer speakers. They use, uh, they're the, you know, like yay size big. They sell them at Target. They're like 100 bucks. And uh, I'll plug those two into that TC Helicon. And uh, it goes in a carry-on case so I can fly with it. And it usually gives me more than enough sound to make the point. Well. Matt, thank you so much. What a wealth of information um, tonight. And um, I cannot thank you enough for joining us and to all of our chatters tonight. Um, and before we sign off, I want two things. Just to once again thank Inside View Press and Scott McCoy for sponsoring us this year. And to remind you that our next uh, final chat this season will be May 10th. And it's just a teacher's chat. Um, so I would love ideas of what's up for all of you te NATS teachers. What do you want to talk about? Um, maybe we just troubleshoot uh, challenging students, <laughs> challenging students emotionally or technically. We can take it in all sorts of directions. So send me an email or a Facebook message if you have something in particular that you would like to talk about on our next, next NATS chat. And Matt, thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's been great. And uh, just to throw it out there, since it's a Nats event, this summer at the Summer Workshop, I am one of the presenters. And one of the sessions, the two-hour sessions I'm going to do, is going to be on audio technology. And uh, the other clinicians that are on this workshop are fabulous. And uh, I think there will be an exciting three days that we're there. And uh, just one final thought. If this stuff all seems overwhelming, it can be at first. And I think the best way to figure all this out is just start playing with the stuff that makes sense to you. And, you know, I like to provide this information so that there are resources kind of in a central location that people can go to and read more about this and review a video and then start doing something with it. But the reality of it is, you know, I didn't learn this stuff watching 45-minute videos. I've learned this over, like, 10 years of playing with it. Okay. And uh, so jump on in. I think this is the future, and I think, you know, we all made it through – you know, undergrads and masters and doctor degrees, and we survived that. I think we can figure out how to use a microphone and some speakers. So just take some playing around with. This is less daunting than Shankarian analysis. I can guarantee that. Uh, thanks, Matt. If you'll hang on for just a second, we will say goodbye to our chatters and then just right. have this chat real quick. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. See you in May. Good night.